Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the seventh installment of our Global Perspective Speaker Series for 2021. My name is Mark Wynn. I'm a Vice President in the International Group here at the Dallas Fed and Director of the Bank's Globalization Institute, which hosts these events in collaboration with our Communications and Outreach Department. Our guest this evening is Betsy Price, who will shortly be stepping down as Mayor of Fort Worth, a position she was first elected to in 2011. As the 44th mayor of the city of Fort Worth, Price has served five terms as mayor and is on track to be the longest serving mayor in the city's history. As the 13th largest city in the United States, Fort Worth remains one of the fastest growing large cities in the country. Since taking office, uh, Price has initiated a broad agenda founded in the values of fiscal responsibility, accessibility, transparency, and accountability. Her emphasis has been on economic development, strengthening education, promoting public safety and improving mobility. Her vision is a healthy, engaged and fiscally responsible city. I know from Betsy's bio that she is an avid cyclist and that under her leadership, Fort Worth has become a foremost cycling community, adding miles of new bike lanes and trails. And as a Dallas resident and someone who has taken advantage of those bike trails over the years, I greatly appreciate that initiative. Promoting uh, pedestrian friendly urban villages has also remained uh, a staple of Price's vision for rebuilding the city's urban core. Moreover, she continues to push her long term goal of linking neighborhoods and job centers with a comprehensive and convenient commuter rail system. Price graduated from Arlington Heights High School and earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Arlington. Since then, she has been an active leader in the Fort Worth community, serving on numerous boards, commissions and professional associations. After running her own successful business for 17 years, Price turned to public service and was elected in 2000 to serve as Tarrant County's tax assessor, where she quickly made her department one of the most efficient in Texas, saving taxpayers millions of dollars. And the rest, of course, is history. <laughs> this evening, Betsy will participate in a moderated conversation with Rob Kaplan, who is the current president and CEO of the Dallas Fed. Before joining the Fed, Rob was the Martin Marshall Professor of Management Practice and Senior Associate Dean at Harvard Business School, which he joined in 2005 after a long business career at Goldman Sachs. About 30 minutes into our event this evening, we will be taking audience questions. If you'd like to ask the speakers a live question, please click on the raise hand icon on the control bar to enter the queue. If you would prefer to submit a written question, use the Q&A button on the same control bar to submit your question to the queue. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible and also try to address questions in the order in which they are received. And we apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Rob. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'd also like to thank Jenna Dillenbach, who's behind the scenes making these global perspectives possible. But most importantly, thank you, Mayor Price. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. We've, we've uh, done things together over the last several yeah. years. I think you've done a great job as mayor. And it's a real honor to have you here uh, just a month or two before your tenure ends because you've done such a great job. Um, Thank uh, you. But I wanna talk a little bit, we're gonna talk a little bit about your life leading up to government service then up to, up to mayor. And, uh, and, and first, tell us a little bit, uh, you, were, uh, you were in the family business, in the, in the, in the car business. And then you uh, ran a title service business. Tell us a little bit about your business career before uh, you went into government service. Yeah, I mean, I've been serving long enough now. Sometimes you think, was there life before this? <laughs> but indeed, there was. I mean, I was fortunate enough. My father was a car dealer here in Fort Worth, came here after the war. And, and the business uh, was here until last year for 75 years in Fort Worth. And I worked from the time I can remember, from the time I could drive, I worked for him doing various odd things. Then my brother took it over and I worked for them. But then I opened a niche business, a title service, working for about 50 of the car dealers in town. And that's how I came to be tax assessor. I mean, I got pressed to run to try to make that office more important. But in the interim, I've always been about service. And I was had the pleasure of serving as, you know, PTA president at three different schools and site-based management team and junior league. And, you know, there are times I look back and think, how in the world did I do all that with three children? But my husband and I both are small business owners. So we had the ability to flex and do what we wanted to. And it was a fun time watching Fort Worth grow. And I was born in Fort Worth, so I'm native and uh, watching Fort Worth grow and expand and being a part of that growth. Now you've told me before 
that you saw the tax collector office when you were in private business and you said, we can do this better. What was it you saw that you thought could be improved and how did you approach, uh, how'd you approach the job for 10 years? Well, one thing I saw was it was a terribly inefficient office with a big budget, 200 and something people. And the wait time, the average wait time for just the public, let alone the dealer's representatives who had a little bit separate section, the average wait time was nearly 45 minutes for a transaction in the tax office. And I just knew we could do better. And my customers said, I kept saying, somebody's got to solve this, guys. And finally, they set me down and said that somebody needs to be you. You can do this. And I've got a bit of a reputation for being a fixer. You can, you can fix this, Betsy. I've kind of had that all my life. And so I ran and, and had tremendous out support in the community. And the idea was to tackle it more from a customer service level. I wanted the experience for people coming in to be excellent. I wanted it to be efficient. I wanted to reduce the budget. We were able to cut the budget the first three years I was in office by more than a million dollars. And by the time I'd served 11 years, we'd reduce the staff to 170 people. And the average wait time was eight minutes. And what's a typical transaction with, what's the nature of a typical transaction with the tax collector's office? It all depends on where you are. If you're paying property taxes, generally in the December to January timeframe, People, not as much now, There's we added the online presence. There was no online presence, no ACH of any kind, no credit cards. We added all that. People coming in there. And then if you're motor vehicle, people were coming in to renew their license sticker or to transfer their car title when they bought it. And of course, the dealers were transferring titles, getting license plates, paying their vehicle inventory taxes, which is based on what they have on their lot on January 1st. So it's a wide range. Plus my children used to laugh because the tax assessor in Texas issues the liquor licenses. You renew everybody's liquor licenses. And when one of my kids turned 21, he said, mom, your name's on the wall in every gin joint in town. (laughs) (laughs) Because you have to sign that liquor license. And when in your tenure at the tax collector's office, did you say, I think I'd like to run for mayor? I never did say I think I'd like to run for mayor. I got recruited to run for mayor. We had tremendous success in the tax office and got recognized not just in the state, but all over the nation. And I served as the president for the State Association of Tax Assessor Collectors and as a vice president on the National Association. And people in Fort Worth started coming to me and saying, when Mayor Moncrief retires, you're going to run for mayor. And I said, I don't think so. That's a different beast altogether. The tax assessors is more administrative. Plus, it has a nice salary. And as you know, the mayor's is more demanding and virtually no salary. But it's never been about the money for me or for my family. We've been blessed to be able to do what we want it to within reason. I mean, there are times my husband says, I wish you at least could pay your own dry cleaning bill. <laughs> because the mayor desk makes 29000 But I kept getting recruited. And finally, I said no for six months. My family said, no, that's a seven-day-a-week, 365 job, mom, and much more pressure. And finally, uh, I went to my minister and I went to some of my associates and they said, you got to do this. There's no reason you're not stepping up to do it. And I went back home and my kids said, yeah, we think you're right. And my husband reluctantly said, Yeah, I think they're right. You need to solve the pension at the city and solve the city's financial issues. So that was the call. So so you got elected. Uh, Was it fun to run, by the way? You'd run for tax collector before. So you knew a little about uh, running for uh, office. What was the? How was this different than running previously? You know, I ran as a Republican office holder because the tax assessor is a partisan office. And so that I ran three times and won three times as tax assessor. And that's a countywide operation. This is city only. And while the city makes up more than half of the county, it's still it's a big city, but it was a little more confined and it's a nonpartisan issue. And I ran against two formerly sitting city council members. One was still on the council and one had retired. And, you know, they both thought they knew more than I did. And I beat them both. But it was interesting working in the city because I live in Fort Worth and it's my home. And it was I I knew how critical the things we needed to change were going to be to the success of the city. So let's talk about the big challenges you've tackled as mayor of Fort Worth. 
Yeah, one of the first ones was the pension. We are the only city, the city's pension, well, to begin with, the year I took office, the city's budget was 50 million underwater coming out of the 08, 09 uh, slump, shall we say, for lack of a better term. Right. We were in the hole, and that wasn't even tacking it, tackling the pension. The pension was millions of dollars underwater with no cap on it. It was growing. Their liability was growing every year because it was an outdated pension system. And so- And by I, the way, this is the pension for teachers, policemen- no, for Public police employees. and fire and city employees, not Got teachers, it. but police, mm -hmm. fire and city employees. Okay. And it's critical that you're, I mean, and it was a pension that was established when the city didn't pay well. And so they had a very rich pension mm -hmm. and we didn't want to cut it, but our pay had gone up, but our corresponding response on the pension had not. We were looking at hitting 25% of our payroll in pension payments, and that's not sustainable for a city. And city of Fort Worth had the highest tax rate of any major city in the, in the state that made us not very competitive. So that was one of the first things we had to tackle was we tackled the pension not once, but we had to do it again about three years ago. We knew it'd have to be done incrementally. We made our final change three years ago and got it ado adopted. And we're the only Texas large city that did it locally without having to go to the legislature and get direction to do it. So can I ask how you did it? Yeah, we got, first we changed the overtime because what was happening was overtime was calculated into your pension for a high five years. So everybody was working 100 hours a week, the last two, what well, was high three, we right. moved to high five. And we quit that gamesmanship and you can still work all the overtime you want, but it doesn't go against your pension. Got it. And we just made incremental changes like that. And the first vote we took to change it was on the overtime and police and fire really came against us. I mean, there were hundreds of them stood in the uh, audience and said, you can't pass this. We've never, you've never crossed us. And it, I said, well, I campaigned on this and we're going to solve it or the city's going to go under. We're going to not going to be able to do, you won't have your pension and we won't be able to afford it. And I went home that night. My husband said, you better not be speeding. You'll get a ticket. And if we have a fire, nobody's coming. But then when we finally made them understand this was for their own good, and now they're big backers of mine, big supporters. And when we passed the second changes to change their interest and several other things, uh, they voted. They had to vote on the second change, and they voted 95% to pass it. Wow. So, so what'd you learn from that? That's quite a lesson. You know, I think I learned what I've known all along. I'm pretty hard headed <laughs> when you make up your mind to do something. But what I really learned was you've got to get major buy in from the public yeah. because we went to the public and said, here's how this impacts the services the city can deliver to you. It means if our payroll has to keep going up on pension contributions that we can't fund streets, we'll have to stop hiring police officers, we'll have to stop hiring additional firefighters, just cutting city services in order to fund that pension liability. And what it took was a strong grassroots efforts of citizens saying, you make these changes and we'll support you. And, and what, it gave what, my council members the background that they needed to stand up and support this too. And what won over the police and the fire, the firemen that they ultimately supported you? I think them? what really won them over really was an explanation. What we were seeing after the very first vote, I started digging in. And what we were really seeing was their union leaders who didn't un really understand the gravity of where their pension was going and what it did to the city. It took, and I'd sat down with them, but they were resistant. But we took to sitting down with small groups of younger, newer firefighters officers and general employees and saying, here's what you're going to get. You've got a long career with us, but your pension's not going to be there. So it took working and communicating with those small groups to really deliver the message. And as they begin to understand it, their union leaders, their POA and 440 leaders begin to come around and say, you're making a valid case with our members and they're listening to you. And what other big challenges did you uh, did you face uh, after the pension? We know the other challenges, of course, continue to be the growth. Fort Worth was in from 20, 2000 to 2010, the fastest growing city in the nation. 
And then this census will be the second fastest growing right behind Seattle. Just managing that growth. Fort Worth is a city. It's a big city. I mean, we're over 900,000 people now, but we're a city of character. We're a little different city. We still have a small town feel. People still will talk to you and help you. And we still have our stockyards and our museum areas. And managing that growth while we had all these new people coming in and keeping our identity was a challenge. And it's we've pretty much settled that by, you know, but we're a big city. We're 352 square miles. So we've grown on the outskirts with a lot of new people who didn't know the city. So I know from talking to you over the years that uh, the coordination with the city of Dallas and establishing Dallas-Fort Worth as a global trade destination have been very important to you. How, how have you gone about uh, uh, approaching those issues? Well, I've always believed that we're stronger as a region, and we are the fourth largest metropolitan region in the nation, and went directly behind Chicago. And when the census comes out, we may very well eclipse Chicago as a metropolitan region this time. So I've always thought people don't see borders. They, you know, go to Dallas for dinner and they live in Fort Worth or they work in Dallas and live in Fort Worth or they live in Dallas and come here for museums and dining and the stockyards. So why not? They just don't see those borders. So why not work this as a bigger region? And I was fortunate that Mayor Rawlings, the former mayor of Dallas, was elected the same day I was. And Mike has a great approach on regionalism. We got to be good friends. And of course, the real anchor there is that both cities co-own DFW Airport, right. one of the busiest airports in the nation. And it's, it's a huge economic engine for us about, and I forgot, billions. And then also we sit directly between Dallas and Fort Worth is I-35, and that's the what used to be NAFTA, now the USMCA, right. that's the highway between the two. And Canada generates nearly 10 billion for our economy and Mexico right at 9 billion. So we knew we had to sell this area as a region. We knew we could travel with the airport. And anybody knows me knows I'm going to promote Fort Worth first. In fact, I always said, this is the FWD region. And it drove Mayor Rawlings crazy. <laughs> And then I started saying, because my, uh, Dr. Carson, the Secretary of Housing and Education said, I know what DFW stands for, it stands for Destination Fort Worth. But the reality of it is, if Dallas was competing for something and we weren't, we were glad to help them. And vice versa, if they were competing, they were glad to help us. And it, ju it just made more sense. And so we traveled a whole lot together. It wasn't unusual for Mike and I to be in Dallas or Chicago or London or Mexico or even Australia and Abu Dhabi and Dubai selling the city and selling the region. And I was quite happy if Plano, Frisco and Dallas got something and they were equally happy if Fort Worth and South Lake and Grapevine got something. Great. It was a collaborative, determined approach. And yeah, we no, added, I watched it. I saw it. It, it, yeah. it, it was for real. Yeah, and we added a lot of international flights. I mean, I think we had 40 flights at DFW when we first took office, and now we have 69 flight, international flights out of DFW. Okay, so now something like, uh, I guess I lost track of myself, 15 months ago, COVID, COVID is upon us. And I know you, along with the Tarrant County Judge, uh, Glenn, Glenn Whiteley, had to make some very tough decisions. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, how did you deal with COVID as it, as it unfolded and what were the, the big decisions you had to make? Well, whoever expected we'd have a pandemic, let alone that we'd be dealing with it 14, 15 months later. And it came upon us. I can remember February of 2020, somebody mentioned COVID and we were on a mayor's call and everybody's like, yeah, but it's not going to be a big deal. Right. And Judge Whitley and I talked about it and we thought, OK. And then along came March and the governor left it up to the mayors of the big cities to make a decision whether they wanted to shut down or how they wanted to handle it. And so that afternoon, we called together a big city mayors group, which I co-chair, and it's the top 10, 12 cities in the Texas and within 24 hours, we had a stay at home order issued that covered 84% of the population in Texas. Then we all came together and in Fort Worth, we'd started a campaign called Y'all Wear a Mask. 
and we came together in the region, adopted the Y'all Wear a Mask campaign. It really was about working together. Judge Whitley, the county runs the public health piece. We were partnered with them. We volunteered all our firefighters or paramedics. We got them to help with it. We started um, Fort Worth Now to help small businesses survive this and to get our CEOs at the table saying, what can we do? And when we begin to come out of this, how can we position ourselves to be stronger? It really was an all out, all hands on deck coordinated effort. And you gotta have good working rapport with the other cities, not just the big cities, but the small ones around you. There are 41 cities in Tarrant County and they were looking for Fort Worth and the county judge to lead. And I was very pleased with the response to uh, COVID. So I know a big part of your focus has been uh, on the fact that certain groups have been disproportionately negatively affected. Yep. Uh, mothers with children, um, uh, low income workers, yeah. uh, 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 people that are very dependent on child care, uh, as we just talked through. What, what kinds of things have you tried to do to help those uh, uh, disproportionately affected groups? Well, you're right. There were lots of groups, particularly in the uh, entertainment industry and the white staff industry, the hospitality industry, particularly mothers or fathers with small children and what they did. And we had started nearly a year and a half ago, nearly two years ago, I guess, best places for children and best places for families to make Fort Worth. We are the second we're of the large cities. We're the second largest with the biggest population of children in uh -huh. our area. So we have a, we're very young. We're average age is 33.8 in Fort Worth. And we wanted this to be a great place for families. And we knew the families at the lower end of the spectrum were struggling. So best places for children stepped up and worked closely with the school districts, getting out, reading material. We started Camp Worth um, which took on tutoring parents. We got Facebook to donate a bunch of laptops and expertise. And in the afternoons, parents whose kids were learning virtual could, or grandparents, we have so many grandparents raising kids, they could come to our community centers and learn how to help their children virtually. We got the children in, those who didn't have anybody at home, we hired tutors to come into our community centers and they could bring their kids and they'd work with their teachers during the day and get their lessons in. But then one of the big things we did was we took five million of our CARES dollars, the federal relief dollars, and put broadband into the underprivileged communities. And what we did was hire booster equipment and we fed it off of our community centers and city owned buildings because we clearly have broadband in all the city facilities, but yeah. we had low income areas who just didn't have it. They couldn't work virtually. They couldn't, their kids couldn't do their lessons. So we put in towers that boost the signal and target it into those low income areas. And we were able to get nearly 6,000 families uh, broadband service to help them with their, what they needed. So there was a concern, uh, I guess, uh, before the CARES Act, and maybe even after uh, the second round of funding later, later last year, that, gee, the cities, the states, particularly the cities, they just couldn't make ends meet because they had a big fiscal hole. And would they be able to have enough money to do all the things they need to do? Uh, I guess I don't need to tell people, uh, given what happened. Uh, What's your, what's your assessment now of uh, uh, the amount of money you've received doing what you need to do? How do you calibrate where we are? Well, I think we're doing pretty well. First and foremost, the federal dollars have been massive. I'm very worried as, as a conservative about my grandchildren having to pay this back. Yeah. And I'm very worried about what it's done to some of our employers who can't get people back to work. Right. It's been an unintended consequence. We made the commitment early on that none of this money would go to fund our budget, that it would go directly in the hands of small businesses. We put 34% of our first money into small business hands immediately. We put $55 million into the hands of small businesses to help them get back on their feet. This next round of funds that's coming we, the commitment is that that'll be used. It has to be a one-time shot, not an ongoing expense for the city because we're only going to get this money once. Right. And it's got to be something that's got a return on it that will benefit the community. 
whether that's serving small businesses, whether that's broadband. The only exception is going to be our visitors and convention bureau was hard hit because there are no convention and no visitors. And to bring back a lot of our hospitality and our entertainment area, we've got to get them back on their feet. So we're going to take a small amount of this next round of funds and support them. I think overall, I mean, our commitment was that the city budget's in good shape. We'll tighten our belt a little bit but that our business community and our citizens needed it more than we did. And that's what these federal dollars should flow down for. Okay. Winter storm Yuri. Uh, so, uh, no, again. Uh, yeah. So that came out of nowhere. How did it affect, how did it affect Fort Worth? It was huge effect. I mean, it was Valentine's night when it hit and it was very much a domino effect. I mean, we have five water treatment plants and the assumption has always been that we could keep those running or even even if one went offline, we have four more to back it up. We lost three of those water plants that night when the power went out and froze them up. And then a fourth one was greatly reduced in volume. And that really impacted our ability to deliver water, not just for us, but we sell water. We're a retailer of processed water to 30 different cities around us. So they were all without water. And then when the storm began to come back, power began to come back, it took us a while to ramp up water production again. So we had to get uh, water out to people in apartments, in their houses, food out. But just as importantly, we were dealing, in an average year, we have 700 water main breaks. In yeah. six day period, we had 760 water main breaks that had to be repaired. Yeah, It was very much and all hands on deck 24 seven. And we were able to get the mains fixed in less than a week and water back. We still had a few people in apartments. We worked closely with the apartments association to try to get them relocated. Heck, we even had showers that were donated, mobile showers that we put in the community center for people. So obviously the legislature is uh, actively working and the governor actively working on the grid issues. Uh, for the city of Fort Worth, any, any lessons you think for businesses, families living there? I know a lot of people are now gonna winterize yeah. their facilities, but what, what do you sense is the big lessons from this storm? I really do think part of, for us, the lesson is that we're got to better winterize our water plants and our ability to continue to deliver that service. We thought we had them adequately winterized, but clearly we got to go a step further down. What we're hearing from people here is that their apartment, particularly apartment owners, that the apartments have got to be better winterized and we've got to be better prepared if there is a break to deliver power and water to them, people's own homes. We've got to figure out, we had warming centers, just they were hard for people to get to in many cases. And a lot of people are are buying generators. You can't get a generator now. They're nowhere to be had. But it's it's mostly about the winterization, I think. Before we go to the broader audience, uh, I'm going to come back to something you said. Uh, As you said, you you were... uh, historically a conservative, but as mayor, it's bipartisan. I think you have a reputation for taking tough issues and bringing people together. And I guess it goes without saying, when you read the paper or you watch the news in our country, doesn't seem to be a lot of that. Uh, what, what, what do you think needs to be done to improve the ability to solve problems and work across the aisle, so to speak, and get, get problems solved in the way you have? I really think, I mean, we always say police officers, firefighters, and potholes aren't partisan. You got to deliver that service. And good governance happens, Rob, in the middle. You lean right or you lean left, but you've got to be able to bring your counsel, in my case, to the table and say what's best for our citizens. It's not parochial. It's not what's best for my district as a council person. It's what's best for the city of Fort Worth. And I think service above self, and collaboration are lost in this country. I think we've gotten too far on the extremes of both ends and we've been fortunate in Fort Worth, we've been able to keep a pretty good even balance and be congenial with each other and come to the table and discuss it and settle it. And I think more people at the state and at the federal level need to realize we don't get anywhere if we're not gonna collaborate. You can't do it in business. No. You sure can't do it in government. No. 
So, uh, you know, a lot's been made of, uh, is it money in politics? Is it gerrymandering? Is it, you know, the, the, the risk that you're going to get primaried on your left or on your right? What, what, why do you think we're having such a hard time? You want my honest opinion? Yeah, I do. I think far too many people have truly become politicians and it's become their career, not their passion and not their service. Yeah. Long time ago, people went into this office, not for their next election, but to make things better, to really serve their community. And from my point of view, that's lost on lots of people right now. And the areas where it isn't lost is are the ones that seem to be faring the best. And then, of course, the flip side of that is we can't be all things to all people. And people have you have to government's got to be there to assist and facilitate you not to run your life and not to do it for you, but rather to be there as a resource if you need them. All right. Makes sense. All right. We're going to start taking questions from the audience. And uh, okay. let me turn to the master of ceremonies, Mark Wynn. And uh, hey, let's Mark. take some questions. Okay. So thank you. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, if you'd like to ask a live question, just click on the raise hand icon on the control bar at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to you. And while we're waiting for questions, I'll take a few from the Q&A chat. Uh, the first one is from Jessica Gordon on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion has become an increasingly important and popular theme at the city, state, and federal levels of government. Can you talk about what kinds of DEI initiatives and activities the city of Fort Worth has developed and implemented? Yeah, it has become a topic, somebody said the topic du jour, but really this is work that's been going on for a long time. We undertook six years ago in the city of Fort Worth, a diversity study for our staff and have had a concentrated focus on hiring more people and not just at the entry level, but more department heads and more managers that are diverse. Our neighborhood association, we've taken three to $5 million every year for six years now and picked out a neighborhood to reinvest in that brings that fabric, that diversity and include them more, neighborhoods particularly that were in need and and felt like they were being left out to try to prove them. But one of the things particularly that we've worked hard on, we hired a diversity and inclusion officer 13, 14 months ago now to work with the community, to hear their concerns unvarnished by politics or anything and to bring them back to us for us to implement better policies. And we hired a police monitor whose job it is to help us recruit more diverse police and firefighters. And I'm proud to say for the first time this time in our firefighters class, it was very diverse. Firefighters traditionally are traditionally male and they've tended to be all Caucasian. This class had a third women and better than a third minorities in it. So we're making some progress. And it's an ongoing battle that people have to do. We did a race and cultural task force report that brought 22 recommendations forward to us. Councils adopted them all but two, and we're working on those two. It's got to be a focus of what you do. And that diversity is truly what makes the fabric of your city so much better. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, from the uh, queue is from Marsha. Akins, uh, always a great treat to hear Betsy speak. Uh, I want to hear about the Blue Zones relationship that the city of Fort Worth leaned into. It's becoming quite popular around the country to encourage healthy living. Yeah, seven years ago, we start, when I was first elected 10 years ago, I realized that the health of this city was we were getting more obese, more diabetes, and it isn't just Fort Worth, it's all over the nation. Our children were pre-diabetic and none of that helps with your workforce. You got people out of work when they're sick, you've got children at home and mothers at home when their children are sick. They can't learn if their health isn't good. And the top expense for any business is healthcare. Behind payroll, it's always healthcare. So we started looking at what we could do, not for the city to drive it, but what could we do for the grassroots end to help people understand and begin to take ownership of their health. And at the same time, the chamber was beginning to work with their businesses and say, what do you need? And they all said, we need help with the health of our workforce. And then we got THR, our healthcare, to come on board. And we decided to adopt 
the Blue Zones model. And when they came and looked at us, they come and evaluate, they said, you can't do this. This is Texas. Texas is beef eaters and doesn't take well to driving healthcare concerns. And I said, we're already started because we'd started an effort called Fit Worth. It was for children working with the school districts. And finally, they surveyed the community for three months and said, I do think you've got the buy-in to do it. So it wasn't about government driving it, but we came together and started quadrant by quadrant in the city working on it. Gallup Wellbeing surveys the top 190 cities in the nation, everything from financial well-being to what do you think of your city, to your health, your mental health. We were number 185 out of 190 on the least healthy cities. This year, we're number 31. Wow. We've gotten that much acceptance and the business is all bought in. For the first time, Blue Zones agreed to let us bring our faith-based community in. The churches led the effort. Mm -hmm. And the school district got two thirds of their schools certified to do it. I'll tell you what's really heartening. I was in the grocery store the other day and there was a little boy and his mother there shopping. And in the grocery stores, they now have items that are marked blue zones, which are healthier than others. And then snacks and things at the other end. This little, this mother was picking up some chips and her son said, no, 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 mommy, get those over there because they're blue zone certified. <laughs> that made me feel really good. So we're making progress. Great. It's a journey. It's not a, it's not a one stop. It's a journey and it'll pay the payoff will be long after I'm gone from here, but it's making progress for the city. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a live question from James Noteware. James, uh, if you unmute yourself, uh, you should be able to ask your question. Uh, yes, Mayor, uh, you mentioned uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I uh, very much respect what you've done over the years. Uh, thank tremendously. you. And I'm an admirer from uh, your southern um, suburb called Houston. Uh, <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned the importance of children and young families in Fort Worth. Tell us about your city's relationship with the local ISD and the quality of education in Fort Worth. Yeah, James, very good question. And thanks for listening from Houston. You can tell Sylvester Turner hello for me, your mayor. Uh, quality of education, I think, in every major city in this nation is not where it needs to be. We started five years ago a program called Read Fort Worth. And the idea was to wake up parents and business community to the struggles in our school district and what was going on. And the goal is... 100% of our kids reading at grade level by third grade, because third grade's the benchmark for kids. They will succeed if they can read at third grade. If they can't, they're a lot more likely to never graduate from high school or never hold a job above minimum wage. And when we started looking at the data and we were taking TSAs, the Texas State, TSEs, education's data, and fine tuning it into Fort Worth and our schools, we came to the realization that less than 33% of our kids were leaving third grade reading at third grade level. That's pretty much across the board true for all of our big cities. So we got a compact with our business community, our PTAs, our churches to begin tutoring kids and reading to kids with the goal of having 100% of our third graders reading by 2025. And 2025 we picked because that year's kids. That was the year the kids entering school would have been third grade. Now we got a little off track with COVID, but we have made a difference. And one of the things I'm most proud of is that people suddenly set up and said, wow, we did in business community, particularly, we did not know that's where we were and that's our future workforce. And we've got to intervene. Now we've got an effort. Read Fort Worth is rolled in under a group called T3, which is Tarrant two and three. It's a cradle to career initiative that's really beginning to take off. There are lots of initiatives in the big cities, but because we'd started best places for kids and best places for families, we were looking also at preschool. It really is about what these kids are doing at three and four that determine where they are in third grade. And so we have now getting more of our uh, preschool teachers certified, more rising star care centers. We've got our philanthropic community working with the preschools. It's a concentrated effort pretty much from birth to career. And we're all going to have to take ownership of it and really begin to move the needle. And our superintendents, we have 
16 school districts in Fort Worth, and they're all on board with helping us move this. Can, can I ask one follow-up? Because you, you sure. alluded to it. Uh, I think you made great progress, and, and I think the state was making great progress, and then COVID hit. Right. We're hearing you know, about early childhood literacy falling behind. Uh, high school dropouts, lack of seniors, uh, you know, seniors not graduating right. at the same rate. What, what, and so I've talked to superintendents quite a bit over the last number of weeks and months about maybe ways to catch up. What, what's your view on what needs to be done to quote unquote catch up so we can get catch up to where we, we should have been? You know, we do have a group of kids that are going to be kind of lost if we don't catch them up. And I think really and truly the only way to catch them up is to get them back in school, to get them back in the classroom. And now that most everybody's vaccinated, schools are proving to be very safe. But the other thing is we're going to have to extend either extend days or extend the school year, depending on what the model is. We've been talking to the governor and the legislatures about doing that. And we also are gonna have to very carefully target the kids who are way behind and make certain that they're the ones that are receiving those extra hours and that extra tutoring. And there's a lot of money coming into the state from the feds that's got to filter down and be on the ground, but very targeted for these kids. And I do think it's not popular, but I do think it's gonna take a longer school year and probably a little bit longer days to ever catch up on it. Yeah. And the teachers will have to be compens compensated. I can't talk this afternoon <laughs> for it, but parents are going to have to take ownership too. And the city's hand in that is we've got several thousand children in our after school program. And we've had for five years now a tutoring component of that. And two years ago, we started hiring education, senior education students from our uh universities to help with that we're going to up the number of tutors we had to try to help these kids sure. because we can do that because we have them in our hands after schools and in the summer good makes sense thank you uh next we have a question in the queue from ken weitzel who's an adjunct professor at tcu um has had the privilege of advising some neely grad students who are working with the Fort Worth Chamber last summer. How is the city of Fort Worth leveraging the asset of TCU in general and the Neely Business School in particular? I've had the pleasure of speaking to the Neely Business School several times and had a lot of their students as interns in my office and in the city. The city leverages a good many of them for some for paid interns, some for volunteer, but we try to work closely with TCU, University of Texas at Arlington, Texas Wesleyan, to help us advise us on how to catch up on this business, particularly to identify what's the coming trend in businesses and what's our workforce really interested in. You know, the people are working more and more remote now and we want those young TCU students to stay. And we've tried to work closely to, as one of them said to me the other day, in eight years, the city's become a whole lot cooler and a lot more of us are gonna stay. So I think it's, it's essential that we continue working with TCU. Uh, another question on one of your great assets from uh, Bob Jamison. Why do you see? Why did you see that investment in the Stockyards National Historic District was so important to support? Well, one of the identities that for people know about Fort Worth is that we're Cowtown and that we have a strong Western heritage. And the Stockyards was one of our true jewels. You mostly know that we ha are the only city in the nation where you can see a Longhorn cattle drive on a main street and an hour later see an original Michelangelo at our museums. To really build on that, to sell that to the general public, not just in Texas, but nationwide and international, we knew the stockyards were gonna be demolition by neglect if we didn't redevelop them. So we found a private partner to come in with some of our existing ones, or they found it and came to us for an incentive package and there was some pushback that it was going to become a Disney world, but we were really, really adamant, built it into our farm-based code that it had to stay authentic and it had to fit the stockyards. And it's just booming now. I was there the other night and it was just, despite the end of the pandemic coming in here, it was shoulder to shoulder people, more new restaurants, a fabulous new five-star hotel, 
their probably $300 million investment in the uh, stockyards, and it's a huge draw for us. And it'll continue to be a big draw because it sets us apart from other big cities. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, if you want to ask a live question, just click on the raise hand icon on the control bar. Uh, I'll take another question then from the queue. Um, small business uh, has received a great deal of support in Fort Worth, but how does uh, the city support technology and startup companies? Is the city focused on tech growth and what is the future of technology in Fort Worth? Yeah, the future of technology is really good. If you look at Texas, people generally say, where's the Silicon Valley of Texas? And most everybody says it's Austin. And indeed, Austin is high profile, but small businesses and small tech, there are more developing and growing small tech companies in Dallas and Fort Worth combined than there are in Austin. And it's a little well-kept secret, but we have Tech Fort Worth, which is our incubator and our uh, business uh, growth. And we have at our back center, our business assistance center, and UNT Health Science Center has a big technology department. We're working with Fort Worth now is working on an accelerator program for both medical and for tech businesses. There's a strong focus. The real backbone of your economy is always gonna be small businesses. And a lot of that has gotta be startups. And if you're gonna to continue to keep our young families here and young entrepreneurs, the real crew that you want to grow this area, you gotta focus on the tech side. So, so let me ask a follow-up to that because you, you alluded to it. Uh, in the work we do at the Dallas Fed, we think Texas is gonna grow. We're at say 29-ish yep. million people, 22 million plus or minus 10 years ago. We think we're on, their, on our way to 40 million people in the state. Or it'll, it will see how long it takes over the next 20 plus or minus years. Uh, it means Fort Worth and Dallas, this whole try is gonna really grow dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and the pandemic has accelerated, if anything, the migration from other places. Yep. What kinds of things are you seeing in terms of migration and what, what investments, what things need to be done to help facilitate this continued growth and migration of people and firms to the, to the state and to Fort Worth? Yeah, I think a lot of this migration is because a lot of people are moving away from real dense cities, particularly the pandemic. That may have been gonna happen anyway, but the pandemic has really accelerated it. And then the ability to work remotely has made it even more so. People are moving into our suburban areas, particularly more than ever before. And I think what the draw, part of the draw there is smaller school districts that have a little better quality than many of the big dense urban schools, a little less government intervention in their lives, lower taxes, and the ability to have tech and broadband here. And I think all of those things are attracting. I mean, look, Fort Worth alone is growing at 22.2% uh, this year. And a whole lot of that growth is on our, is on our sub suburban regions of our city and good infrastructure, great roads, good water that we talked about earlier when we talked about the storm, all of those are gonna be critical to managing that growth that's coming in and that migration we're seeing. And we've seen that for nearly 20 years, but it's really ramped up. And, and a lot of discussion for obvious reasons recently about supply demand in single family homes. Yeah, uh, lots of- What can be done of, about that, do you think? We've got to get a little better. Texas has always been good real estate prices, but our average home price is now escalated up. There are hardly, there are very few really what we would consider entry level homes left. We've got to put a strong focus on doing that. I saw a building recently, a demonstration of some new homes that are coming in that are small, efficient, good looking homes, high tech, but they're built kind of in, commercial business, you might say they're tilt wall, but this are not, but these are, can be built in a very short time, a month, smaller pad sites in a neighborhood and they're real good looking. I think that's, but their average price is gonna be very affordable for people. I think that's the key. We've got to find a way to bring in developers who can build houses that families can be in. We can build all the apartments we want, 
but ultimately families are looking to own a home or at bare minimum, we're, we're doing some developments that they're doing uh, homes for lease. The developer is building them and leasing them back. They want a home, they want a small yard, they want a neighborhood. And we've got to find out how to get those prices back down. Okay, yep, makes sense. Uh, we have another live question, uh, this time from Andrea Bellucci. Andrea, go ahead and ask your question. Good evening, Mayor Price. I Hi. First, I first would like to say thank you for all your service these past 10 years. I've lived in Fort Worth for over 20 years and absolutely love it. The city has changed for the best and I truly appreciate your leadership. Thank you. So the next mayor will have some pretty big shoes to fill. Um, I'm curious, what are your plans after retirement? Do you plan to completely exit out of government service? No, I, I don't think so. I'm gonna, I don't have any specific plans. My plans first to spend the next six months kind of riding my bicycle, traveling a little with my husband and playing with my six grandkids. But I've always been involved in service at one type or another. And if I get a calling that I feel like I can make a difference, I'll return on the public side or I'll serve on the private side or in a volunteer capacity. But I'm, I, I, I'm not one to sit still. I may be getting a little older, but I've never sat still. And I think I still have the capacity to bring something to the community. And, and we'll just see what unveils here for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, and we have another live question, this time from uh, Brian Barton. Uh, Brian, go ahead and ask your question. Um, did we lose him? Looks like is. we, did we? I think so. Yep, I, I think there's some technical issue there. Okay, I'll go back to the uh, submitted questions. And this goes back to a question that was asked earlier. What would you say is the biggest infrastructure need of the DFW Metroplex over the next 20 to 50 years? Gosh, in Texas, it's always going to be highways, even if we stress not uh, building as many highways, trying to get less cars back, but you're still going to have to We've not had a major building of our interstates and even our inner city roads for years and years and years, for decades, actually. We're going to have to expand and renovate those. But transit continues to be an issue, and hopefully uh, we'll get better rail systems here. Texans love their cars. We say, you know, in Fort Worth, Bubba and Bubbette love their pickups and Suburbans, and they're not going to give them up. We just have to figure out how do we get that going. And I don't think it's buses, and I'm not sure about trains, but alternative transportation on demand. We got to get real creative and real innovative looking at transit as well as keeping our roads in better shape. Water, people always say, what about water? Water in Tarrant County and in Fort Worth is in pretty good shape. We're well prepared on water and stormwater. But long term, it's going to be getting around because we don't want to live in gridlock. We don't want to end up like New York, Chicago, L.A., those cities. We have to be a little smarter than that. So, so on that, I'll also ask about climate change and sustainability, which I know you think about. And the, the challenge is to find a balance in that. Uh, how are you approaching in Fort Worth uh, the issue of uh, creating uh, uh, let fewer, less greenhouse gas emissions, better sustainability? Yeah, it's always a challenge. And cars in Texas are a big piece of that. The airport's clearly a big piece of that. But years ago, we started a push at the airport to be carbon neutral, not on the planes, but on the airport itself. We're the first carbon neutral airport in the world. Wow. Certified nearly two years ago now. City of Fort Worth joined the Better, Bu better Building Challenge nearly 10 years ago now for 20% of our buildings to be 20% reduction by 2020. We hit that mark well before 2020. Now we're working on trying to get to 30 to 40% of our buildings. Uh, we're working with our planning and development people on any ordinances. How do we try to get our businesses to help and inspire that? working with our home builders. Oh, I think it's just, a, it's got to be multi-pronged and it isn't going to come just with electric cars. They make up about 2% or less of what we drive or electric trucks, but it'll be all of that for working together. And we, 
some of our contracts, like our contract with waste management, five years ago, we said, we want you to move all your vehicles as this part of this contract to uh, liquid gas. And they've moved to uh, LPG. And that's a big help with those big trucks going in. And we bought some at the city to use that aren't gas powered. Somebody said, move your whole police fleet. Well, you can't, you don't have the power for chases and for things with the electric vehicles for them. So you gotta be sensible about it, but it's the little touches that are ultimately gonna move us that direction. Uh, another question that came in through the Q and A, do you have any concerns about any of the corporate or voter legislation currently under consideration in the legislature, uh, making Texas a less attractive destination for corporate relocations? Well, I think first and foremost, everybody wants elections to be secure. And are there examples of voter fraud? Sure, there are. I personally don't think they're as widespread as some of what they want to talk about. Uh, and I think it's got to, I mean, you got to have security in your elections, but you got to be smart about it. You can't disenfranchise voters and you can't make it harder. That said, I got no problem with people having to have an ID. Everybody's got an ID. You got to have an ID for anything you do these days. But I also like, we went to an open voting. You don't have to go to your precinct to vote anymore. Last election, now you can vote anywhere on the county for two weeks early voting and day of voting, you can stop in at any polling site and vote. I think it's got to be balanced out and reasonable because it can impact business. And many of our big businesses have weighed in on this, but I don't think Texas is on the verge of stopping business development over this. I think you got a few more sensible people than that in Austin, I hope. <laughs> what? You ask one, Mark, and then I'll, then I'll ask a final question. Okay, uh, last question from me. Uh, well, it's from Charles Moore. Um, what surprised you most about being mayor that you had not anticipated during your time in office? Oh, gosh, there's been so many surprises. Um, the people, the, I, I mean, the people of Fort Worth are incredibly special. I'll tell you one thing that always takes me back. I bet I have taken two million photographs with people. And, and I'm always like, what are you going to do with that? I'm not a celebrity, but people think you are. I mean, today we were at an event for an Iwo Jima survivor, a birthday party for him who's 96. And my staff said, I bet we took 100 pictures at that event. People just want a picture with the mayor. And I'm happy to oblige him. But it just takes me back to for people to think you're a celebrity because I'm not. I'm just me. I'm the same person I was 10 years ago a little older, a little more wrinkled. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a second to final question. So this is a seven day a week job. How busy are you on Saturdays and Sundays on most weekends? Well, I had a rule of thumb going into this and I try to hold it. Uh, every morning I have an hour and a half for exercise because exercise is the only thing that keeps me sane. <laughs> you don't change my calendar when it comes to my exercise. Friday nights are date night. My husband and I spend time with just us or just a couple friends. And Sundays are family time. We may take our family and go to a church that wants me to come other than our own church, or we may go to church on our own and have our kids later. But Saturdays tend to be pretty busy. Before COVID, Saturdays were, Saturdays are the shortest days. Saturdays are probably eight hours. Uh, now with COVID, it goes back and forth. Sometimes they're not more than five or six on Saturday. Other days are average about 12 hours a day. And despite COVID, you've had to be out there physically face to face with people, right? Yeah. You have Pre to be out. even. Yeah, people have to, they've got to have confidence. If we, I mean, I discovered real quick, if I went into hiding, our whole community is, is shook. They yeah. don't know what to think. And we started a Facebook Live initiative every afternoon at five o'clock or six. We did an update on COVID starting last March. Wow. And I would run into people who said, Mayor, you're the only one that's calm, quiet, just the facts, ma'am. And we created a monster because we had 50,000 followers. And they got their update every live. Then we cut it back to two days a week and they had a fit. And so we went to back to four days a week and now we're back to one or two days a week. But you've got to be available to people. 
they expect their mayor to be the anchor for the community. And so we had to be out and about and do that. And we could get experts in, or we could go to the experts, or we could go talk to the superintendent or business leaders, faith leaders. You, you've got to be there. And I got COVID after being quarantined four or five times. I finally got it yeah. and was home, but I, I did fine. All right, good. And I got my vaccines and I'm back out doing what I want to. All right, good. So final question. In this, and I ask this normally at the end of every global perspective. Oops. He just froze. I just lost you, Rob. Yeah, I lost him too. Okay, it isn't just at my end. I think it's a technical problem. Okay. His, his, his final question is always advice for the leaders in the audience. I think the advice to leaders in the audience is don't do a job if you don't have a passion for it. You've got to be passionate about the people. You've got, you don't govern well or you don't lead well behind a desk. You must be out talking to people. I firmly believe I don't believe in, in being behind the desk. I believe being out talking to people is the only way you can govern. It's really the only way you can lead a business. That's being out talking to your employees. Find a passion. You're on mute, Rob. Oops. We had a little technical glitch there, but, uh, but uh, I'm surprised we haven't had more of these. <laughs> I know. Uh, but Mayor, again, as you end your term, you were telling us before we started June 15th, I guess is the end. Uh, mm -hmm. Congratulations and thank you uh, for your leadership and thank you for a job well done. Uh, we thank look you. forward to, to talking with you in the future and other, other capacities. I think you and I are going to be talking about best places for kids in preschool. Coming up here right, in the right. next couple of weeks. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you, Rob, for having me. Mark, thank you for facilitating. Thank you, everybody. Well, th thank you all for joining us this evening. And apologies if you submitted a question that we did not get to. You'll soon receive a survey asking for your feedback on this event, and we'd very much like your uh, candid responses. We hope you'll be able to join us for our final Global Perspectives event of this spring, which will feature former Xerox CEO Ursula Burns. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to let you all know about the Conference on Technology Enabled Disruption that we will be hosting on May 21st. Details on how to register for both events can be found on DallasFed.org. And with that, and we're I adjourned. will say one thing just before we sign off. This Technology Enabled Disruption Conference, uh, this is be the third year we've done it. Uh, we've had two previously. This will be done obviously remotely, but it's a huge issue that we've helped pioneer at the Dallas Fed. Technology, of course, replacing people, uh, but but particularly the impact technology and technology-enabled disruption has had on businesses and on the workforce, and particularly on the educational system and the need to develop a more skills training to adapt to it. And so Mark Wynn is the leader of this conference. He's too, too uh, modest to say, but this really is a, is a pioneering effort within the Federal Reserve System. And we really would encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, to plug in. It's, it's very important and one that we've tried to pioneer at the Dallas Fed. So sorry, I interrupted. I apologize. But back to you, Mark Wynn. That, that is it. If you want more details, dallasfed.org. And with that, we are adjourned. Have a good evening. Thank you, everybody.